On this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis pays a visit to the Jewish community at the Synagogue of Rome. A new book-length interview with the Pope is published. We get a sneak peek of the Pope's upcoming trip to Mexico. This plus a new film about the truth of Pope Pius XII. Stay tuned. You're watching Vaticano. Pope Francis visited the major synagogue of Rome on Sunday 17th. The Pope has a personal connection with the Jewish community in Buenos Aires, so his arrival at the Jewish community in Rome was highly anticipated. In the wake of recent jihadist, anti-Semitic and anti-Christian violence, the Pope denounced violence committed in the name of God. Violence of man against man is in contradiction with every religion worthy of that name, and in particular with the three great monotheistic religions. Life is sacred, a gift of God. The fifth commandment of the Decalogue says, do not kill. God is a God of life, and He wants to always promote it and defend it. We are created in His image and likeness, we are called to do the same. The relation of Catholics and Jews has been growing ever closer since the Second Vatican Council 50 years ago. That's when church leaders strongly encouraged reaching out to other religions, in particular Judaism. They set the guidelines in a still very relevant document titled Nostra Etate. We are an interesting point of development, 50 years after Nostra Etate which is a, a fundamental point, uh, a turning point in history. And uh, we have now a good experience. Many problems were solved, others were discussed. And the important point is that there are ways of communication and goodwill to discuss together. According to Rabbi Di Segni, Pope Francis' visit gives the Jewish quarter of Rome two major messages. The first one is that uh, is a, a sign of continuity. This Pope uh, wants to confirm the way of the, his two predecessors and not put a stop in the way of uh, good relation. And the second point is related to the urgency of our time, which is uh, marked by intolerance and violence uh, inspired by religion or bad teacher of religions. And this meeting uh, is uh, just a, a, a signal in the opposite direction. So we want to show that uh, the difference of religions is uh, a seed of uh, tolerance, coexistence and building peace. He was the third pope visiting a synagogue after St. John Paul II in 1986 and Benedict XVI in 2010. All three popes tend to leave a strong impression on people of all religions. Georges de Canino, a Roman Jewish artist, met John Paul II at an audience in the Vatican. We spoke for 20 minutes, and during that time of dialogue, he asked me a question. A question which no one has ever asked me. If I was happy. He asked me if I was happy, and I responded. He was so moved by our discussion, which really moved me. He began to speak to me about his writer friends, which he got to know in Poland in his youth, and of whom I knew nothing, to be honest. It was a lost generation. I realized how deep his soul is, his education, his sensibility and his intelligence. I, I understood that the relation that he had with the Jewish religion was not superficial, not only cultural, but it was a relationship of love, a relation of love, and I will never forget that. Pope Francis will have also left a strong impression, carrying on the tradition of good relations with the Jewish community of Rome. On Sunday during his Angelus address, Pope Francis focused on the evangelization of the poor, explaining that material help is important. 
but the proclamation of the good news is paramount. Today, in our parish communities, in the associations, in the movements, are we faithful to the program of Christ? Is the evangelization of the poor bringing to them the good news, the priority? Be attentive. This isn't about giving social assistance, much less about political activity. It has to do with the strength of the gospel of God, who converts hearts, heals the wounded, transforms human and social relationships according to the logic of love. The poor, in fact, are at the center of the gospel. Pope Francis observed the feast of St. Agnes on January the 21st with the time-honored custom of the blessing of the lambs. The two small lambs, traditionally less than one year old, were placed in baskets and carried to the Pope Urban VIII Chapel in the Vatican's Apostolic Palace, where they received the Holy Father's blessing. Their wool will be used to make palliums, a vestment worn by metropolitan archbishops, which signify their unity with the Church of Rome. After the palliums are woven, they're kept in an urn at the tomb of St. Peter until the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, when they're presented to the archbishops who were newly appointed in the last year. The Pope also received Eric Schmidt in audience. He's the chairman of Google's parent company, Alphabet. The Vatican didn't disclose the content of their discussion. The meeting was said to have lasted 15 minutes. In the past, the 79-year-old Pope Francis has hosted two Google Hangouts from the Vatican, including one in which he confessed he's a dinosaur when it comes to new technology. Nonetheless, he's a social media star, racking up more than 26 million followers on Twitter. On the World Day for Social Communications, Pope Francis also met with Apple CEO Tim Cook for a private discussion. The director of the Holy See's press office explained that Francis is interested in communicating the good news with all means disposable to him. But it is always the same. Pope Francis is interested in communicating the love of God. You can do this with uh, Apple, Google, uh, cinema, uh, television. Uh, this is, uh, uh, he encourages everyone to use his technical capacity, his managerial capacities and so on, to serve the mankind of today <coughs> for a culture of inclusion, of uh, solidarity, of uh, helping the good development of the mankind in love and uh, solidarity for the poor and so on. A book-length interview with Pope Francis was released this month. But more than a book, Pope Francis wanted it to be called a conversation. It is a conversation the Holy Father had with this man, Vatican journalist Andrea Tornielli. At Rome's Augustinianum Institute were also on hand Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Parolin and even famous Italian actor Roberto Benigni. The book entitled The Name of God is Mercy reveals Pope Francis' intimate thoughts on this virtue and Cardinal Parolin said the book's message is a personal one. We are called to make a personal experience of that, not only as a something lit a literary, but something very vital for us. That is, according to me, is what Father means with, uh, with his word. The book is the fruit of conversations between Pope Francis and Andrea Tornielli, who wanted to simply ask the Holy Father what mercy means to him. A dialogue between the Pope's heart and the heart of the people who are reading the book. It means uh, uh, with the, the personal life of the Pope, it's not a book of uh, theology, it's not a theory, it's not an homily, it's not an official document, uh, but it's a conversation the Pope is trying to present and to communicate uh, what uh, mercy uh, means for him in his personal life. The book was released in 86 countries in multiple languages, just in time for the beginning of the Year of Mercy. During a Mass on December 12th for Our Lady of Guadalupe, Pope Francis announced that he will visit the country of Mexico.
There is great excitement for the trip of Pope Francis to Mexico. He is the first Latin American Pope, and the Mexican people feel very close to him. Mexico hosted St. John Paul II five times and in 2012 received Benedict XVI. The country has had full diplomatic relations with the Holy See for 24 years in February. 100 of the 120 million citizens are Catholic and with a vast group of 15 million immigrants to the USA, the papal trip is highly important. Mexicans everywhere wait in anticipation. For that reason, it was decided that the trip should revolve around three major axes. The borders of our country. The border of our country connects Mexico with the center and the south of the Americas in the state of Chiapas. The north border connects us with the United States of America and the center and the capital of the country with the Basilica of Guadalupe in the state of Mexico and the state of Michoacán. The whole trip revolves around Our Lady of Guadalupe, patroness of the Americas, as was wished by Pope Francis himself. Our Lady of Guadalupe is the most prayed to advocate in the whole world. The Basilica of Guadalupe receives 22 million visitors every year, five times more than the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. Our Lady of Guadalupe is considered the patroness and empress of the American continent. Therefore, the pastoral object of this trip, as proposed by the Pope, is that Our Lady of Guadalupe should be a constant presence in this holy year of mercy. Our Lady of Guadalupe is a sociological religious phenomenon that is so important that it actually attracts even non-Catholics or non-practicing Catholics who consider themselves Guadalupanos. In all of Mexican society, you can feel a very profound respect for Our Lady of Guadalupe and the figure of the Holy Father as a religious leader. This recognition of the fundamental role of the pontiff brings about a great hope for the visit of the Pope in Mexico, who is the first Latin American Pope. The expectations are great. Topics that will govern this trip will be issues that indigenous people face, also the role of the family and the challenge of emigration. According to the ambassador, the Pope carries a purely pastoral answer to the problem of migration. We believe that with his message, the Pope reinforces the thesis that the Holy See and Vatican policies always respect the human dignity of the emigrants and their families. We cannot expect the Pope to give a lecture to an organization or to represent a political line to legislators of the different countries in question. For us, the visit of the Pope is of purely pastoral character and should trigger in the different countries initiatives which are in favor of their citizens. In Mexican society, violence rages and liberty is threatened. Pope Francis' message and gestures are much needed, says the ambassador. He will be the first pontiff to be received in the National Palace, the Palacio Nacional, in a country which in the past had dark and light eras of relations with religious institutions, in a country which in the 19th century experienced a profound movement of secularization and in the beginning of the 20th century lived through the War of the Cristiada, in such a country today the mutual relations are founded on respect and communal collaboration. And Pope Francis will be received by President Enrique Peña Nieto in the National Palace, the center of political power. The trip will take place from February 12th through the 17th. The International Conference Center in Geneva. On Friday, January 15th, the participants of this special event discussed Pope Francis encyclical letter Laudato Si, Praise Be to You, and how to devise actions aimed at caring for our common home and those who inhabit it. The encyclical letter Laudato Si by His Holiness the Pope is a forceful call to action, and today's event hopefully will help us to embark on a coordinated approach. 
The point was made that our society will become more multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious and that many leaders fail to prepare their people for it. No one has said it better than Pope Francis when he talked about the globalization of indifference, the lack of leadership, the lack of courage, uh, the lack of uh, international moral authority that's very much in decline. So, Keynote speaker at the conference, Cardinal Peter Turkson, said that he thanked God for the Paris Agreement, which provides a framework for action at every level, but that the most important action is a change of heart. The wilderness, the desert, the destruction that we see outside is a reflection of the wilderness and destruction in the human heart. Okay, it's what we are within ourselves, what we are as people, as characters, as habits, this. So our sinful condition is what makes the world outside also sinful. And so the call for improvement or change begins and must begin with us, deep within us. So the type of ecological conversion that Pope John, uh, St. John Paul II began talking about and which the present Pope takes up is that serious and that profound and deep. So everything that we talk about in hope, it's all based on the grace of God that is capable of changing us and enabling us to do even what is beyond our own native and natural powers. The vast majority of people have come to accept the scientific facts about man-made climate change. I'm very inspired by how Pope Francis has called uh, the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, but all of us, to say and to understand how important these issues are. The Paris Agreement was also a breakthrough, I think. Um, I, I was in Paris and I couldn't hear any who doubted that this is a reality and that it is a human-created reality. Uh, yes, we can be optimistic, but we have the challenge of uh, that we need to change our behaviors, uh, both our behaviors toward the earth, toward nature, but also our behaviors with each other. Everyone agreed that Laudato Si had played a critical factor in encouraging civil society participation and activism and also had united Christians and other religions at an unprecedented level. I am afraid that probably some of the promises made in the official gatherings like the Paris meeting and the environment may not be fully kept. But I am convinced that we as individuals motivated by our faith and our trust in the human family can act in such a way that voluntarily, first of all, that will be conducive to the preservation of the good environment we need. This conference was one of the last assignments for Archbishop Tomasi, who retires at the end of January. He was Apostolic Nuncio to the UN Geneva for over 13 years. Diplomat, statesman, Pope. The Italian Pope Pius XII led the Catholic Church from 1939 to 1958. Uh, Pius XII, by nature and by character and temperament was a man of peace. On the other hand, it was the tragical thing of his entire pontificate that, uh, first of all, he lived during the uh, Second World War, 1939 uh, till 1945, and then quite soon after the Second World War was finished, the Cold War started. So for he was being a man of peace, he had to do all the time with war, and of course that is the tragedy of his life. Critics say he kept silent, doing little to stop the Nazi regime and systematically killing Jews and many others across Europe during that time. A new documentary called Man of Peace, Pope of War, made by a secular TV channel, brings to light new evidence that would say otherwise, that he worked in secret so as not to worsen the persecutions. I am convinced that Pius XII did whatever he could. I am also convinced, and I can prove this and have lived through that, period, a contemporary after all, um, and that uh, certainly uh, any public protest would have been counterproductive. And I've seen it in Holland when the Archbishop of Utrecht, the only Archbishop of Holland, made a public protest. I listened to his speech and my reaction was immediately twofold. I said, well, uh, I was very courageous that a Catholic Archbishop takes it up for the Jews, fine, excellently, uh, chapeau. But, uh, on the other hand, uh, 
what is going to come of it. And as a matter of fact, first of all, the deportation of the Jews was not stopped. On the contrary, it was accelerated. The historian is convinced that the public image of Pius XII will finally return to reflecting reality. The public opinion has been violently manipulated by people like Rolf Hochul, Cornwell and other people like that. Not always with, frankly, quite honest intention, I think. It's propaganda, etc., etc., sensationalism. And unfortunately, this has been spread uh, and has created a public opinion. And once the public opinion is in existence, it is very difficult to change it. But we are doing that. The changes are on the way. I have frequent contact with the directors of the Sorbonne, the University of Paris, and I have many contacts in North America, and things are changing. Even Yad Vashem, the Jewish organization, is changing and uh, beginning to change. The documentary does its part by presenting the facts about this pontiff. What we have tried to do is exactly that. We have based the film on primary sources and on data that is present to us that we want to expound for the public. We do not depart from a preconceived thesis, but tell the story of the life of this man using the material from the Vatican archives, our television station archives, as well as the archive Luce. That is all the material that we have used. Based on comprehensive research of his life, actions and writings, in 2009, Benedict XVI declared him to have exhibited heroic virtue in his life. It's a big first step in the process of being recognized as a saint, and another on the long road to clearing Pius XII's name. Chivalry is not dead. Looking back at a history of 900 years, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre is one of the oldest Catholic papal orders of knighthood. Just before Christmas, a central moment of the life of the order took place in Rome, the investiture of new members. Among them, none other than EWTN's Joan Lewis, known to viewers from her blog Joan's Rome, her radio show Vatican Insider and as a recurring guest at At Home with Jim and Joy. In a so-called mass of investiture, Joan and 43 other knights and ladies were received into the order. That was extraordinary. It was extraordinarily moving uh, because of the liturgy also. Hundreds of years ago, this particular ritual began. So it's not something just invented a few years ago or perfected in 2014. It goes back hundreds of years. And it's a beautiful ceremony. There were 37 men and eight women. And what we do, there's a prayer vigil beforehand. And that's where we make vows and a profession of faith. But the mass itself, where you go up, you stand with your cape over your arm, and the women have their white gloves and their veil on the cape, because we all wear the same. It's a black cape with a red cross on a shoulder. And and then the men have white capes and a red cross on the shoulder. And we process up, we give our capes to someone. We then kneel and receive our main decoration from the bishop. In this case, it w in my case, it was a bishop. Then you move to the side where a person has your cape. You turn around, they put the cape on your shoulder. And I have to tell you, for me, the entire thing, by the way, they also gave us a beautiful book of the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. It was like really taking religious vows. The Order of the Holy Sepulchre has as its principal mission the practice of Christian life by its members in fidelity to the Pope to assist the religious, spiritual, charitable and social works and rites of the Church in the Holy Land, particularly of the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Our primary mission, there's 30,000 of us in 38 different countries, and our primary mission, we're all focused on the Holy Land. So what we do, we support the, the building of schools, the building of hospitals, maybe maternity hospitals. There's a lot we do to support the existing Christian structures and to protect holy places, the Holy Sepulchre, other shrines, and so forth. So that is our main goal. We're in all these different countries, but we're all focused on the Holy Land. Lady Joan has been active for quite a while already and participated in the Order's life. 
I've known of the order, of course, for many years and even have written about it. But I'm greatly in love with the Holy Land. And any time, I mean, I would go there on weekends if that was possible. So what the order does, the protection of Christians in the Holy Land, they are an ever-diminishing number, living out our faith as followers of Christ. That's something I've tried to do for years anyway. So the investiture in December was a, a mere formality. But you are invited into the order. You do not ask. You are invited in for meritorious service to the church, to fellow mankind, and so forth. So for me, it was a humbling experience. It's a great honor, but you know what? It is also a call to service. The order today has approximately 23,000 members in 52 lieutenancies around the world, including monarchs, crown princes, and heads of state. Its headquarters is situated at Palazzo della Rovere, on the Via Conciliazione by the Vatican.